almost 900 years of age. He was 500 years of age before the flood. And God spoke to him and said, I need you to build an ark. And he, he said, Lord, what's an ark? He said, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a ship that when it rains, it's going to rise and float. And Noah said, what's rain? It had never rained before. Before the flood, there was a, a mist that covered the earth and all the vegetation would just grow through the God-given mist in the earth. And the canopy of the earth would not allow the rain to come in. And there would never have been an exposure of rain. So everything was taking place from the inside. And Noah didn't see rain. They didn't understand rain. So for a hundred years, as Noah was building this ark, people were laughing at him, scoffing at him. They didn't like God. They didn't understand God. They didn't worship God. They did not understand why Noah would do this. For a hundred years, he built this ark. And the dimensions were crazy. I mean, what, exactly what he did. So let's look at the way through the flood. Let's start with Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 through 14, and then we'll go down a little later. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence. Because of them, I'm surely going to destroy both them, the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. Now, I like that word pitch because the pitch meant uh, atonement. It means that it's going to be a covering. We're not going to allow the, the wickedness in. I'm going to atone for what was going to take place. And in Genesis chapter 6, verses 15 through 7, 1, it says this. Now, it's a long little text. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark within 18 inches of the top. Put the door in the ark on the side and make a lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of it and in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of every living creature, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of a bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten in store in a way of food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. The Lord, when he said to Noah, go into the ark, literally, it was what he means to come into the ark, you and your family, because I will found grace and righteousness in this generation. It is probably four or five times to this point, God was communicating to, to Noah, I, I am going to destroy the wickedness. God hates wickedness. God loves righteousness. And through all the earth, he found a man he found a man that is faithful. He found a man that he could trust. He had a man that had enough faith to trust in God, to believe in God, to obey him completely, and to build the ark. You know, Noah never communicated to God. God communicated to Noah. There was never a time where you'll say, Noah said this, or Noah asked God. Whatever God communicated to Noah, Noah did explicitly. He didn't say, God, I don't think that'll work. The, the dimensions of the boat, that, that doesn't work. How can, how can a, a, a gigantic boat like that, how could that even float? Noah didn't ask questions. Noah just did what God asked him to do. Now, in our society today, we have all kinds of different versions that we have seen on TV about Noah and the ark. And some of the versions would say, well, it was a, it was a modified flood. It was a, it was a compartmental flood. It was a, it was a natural disaster, but it didn't cover the whole earth. It covered part. But when God says he is going to cover the entire earth, it was a total obliviation of mankind, except for those that were righteous in this boat. Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 says, The mist rose from the ground and the waters of the earth. If you look at the timeline, it appears that Noah is about 500 years of old and he had never seen rain. It always came from the bottom. 
at this time, it is going to devastate from the bottoms, from the roof. It is going to absolutely cover the earth. And every person within that is not in that ark will be destroyed. Why the ark? Why the ark? He called his family. And he says, I want you to bring all the animals in. Seven days, I want you to bring all these animals in. And I love what it said. And then God shut the door. See, the type of Christ that we're looking at right now is the ark. The only people in this time of this devastation that will be saved will be those that are in the ark. See, but it's not all of a sudden. It didn't just happen. God didn't just get mad one day and said, I'm going to take care of this. It has been preached for 969 years. Enoch, when he birthed Methuselah, even the name Methuselah means when he dies, the judgment will come. When he dies, the judgment will come. Enoch was a prophet of God, and he had a job to communicate the truth. Noah was a man, a righteous man, communicating the truth, proclaiming the message of Christ, but the people's hearts became so cold. They said, I don't believe in this God. They were only 1,900 years away from even the creation of the earth, of the existence of Adam and Eve. 1,900 years. And God got so upset, so broken because of the wickedness of heart. And now the ark the covenant between God and Noah and us has been about 4,500 years. So whenever we see the rainbow that God put in the stars, in the clouds, it's a covenant that says, I will never destroy mankind with water again. A covenant, a covenant of patience, a covenant of love, a covenant of destruction though. So let's look at what takes place here. When you see this, you see a couple things. Um, the way through the flood, there's a couple things I think is very important. No, number one, Jesus and the ark are planned and designed by God. Jesus and the ark are designed and planned by God. There are a parallel. The only people that are saved with Noah's day are those that are in the ark of God. Those that are going to be saved in our day are in Christ. You cannot be saved unless you are in the ark. You cannot be saved unless you are in Christ. And those that are in Christ are those that right now have given their life to Christ. And Jesus is our ark. Just like the ark of God was the salvation of mankind, Christ is our ark right now. It is found in even John chapter 3 verse 16. The only begotten, the only one of all kind, the unique son of God. The ark is what Jesus the ark is a type of Jesus as the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the way. You can't get to God. You can't get to God without me. And in Noah, you cannot be saved with the judgment of God without the ark of God. So, they were planned by God. Jesus was planned by God. It was in his unique time. He looked at this world and he saw it was wicked. And he said, I have to have a plan. And that plan has to be Christ. Jesus in the ark inside was the only safe place. This ark was a box. It was a box of wood. And when the rains came and it started to flood and it'd rise up, it didn't have a steering mechanism. It was a holding place for life. And it would rise up and God himself would direct the flood waters and the floods would rise and the ark would rise. And those that were inside that ark were the only safe individuals. All around thousands and hundreds of thousands of people screaming. Understanding the judgment of God is upon them. I'm sure before the waters got too high they were knocking on the door. They were yelling at Noah asking them to come in. But when God shut that door it was too late for them. So what is the parallel today? The parallel today is that what we must do is we have to understand we are going to see the judgment of God. And it's our responsibility in that judgment of God to bring people in Christ. 
to allow them to see what Christ can do for them. It is the only safe place. It is the only safe place for mankind. When God's judgment falls on sinful mankind, the only safe place is in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that people can be saved from the judgment of God. Before it was the ark, but now it's in Christ. This is a major point. Jesus in the ark absorbed God's judgment. Jesus and the ark absorbed God's judgment. He says, build this ark, and I'm going to have the rains come. I'm going to have the floods come and the winds come, and I'm going to destroy every living creature except for those that are in the ark. The winds beat upon that ark. It hit against mountains, against trees. The winds were severe. Their job to stay in that ark was to take care and to keep those animals alive. It was severe. It had judgment. Everyone was going to die that was not in that ark. But yet also Jesus took that judgment. Jesus, those that are in Christ, Jesus hanging on that cross, took our judgment. Just like the ark of God was the safe passageway to God, so is Jesus our safe passageway to God. It took upon him the iniquities of the world, the judgment of God. God did not spare the judgment upon his son. He did not spare his son. He could have loved his son so much, and he said, no, I don't want to put all of mankind's sins on your back. But he became the propitiation or the covering of our sin that when Jesus was on that cross, he had the full effect of God's wrath upon his back, upon his shoulders. Now you would say, well, there's been a lot of people that have been crucified over the past. In the Roman Empire, that was, that was a very popular way of execution. That is physically true. But the way that Jesus died was not the emotion of what is not the normal emotion of everyone else that would be crucified. Jesus, laying on that cross, went through the punishment, the physical punishment of the execution. But God heaped on him every one of our sins. Not only to pay for our sins, but the anxieties, the stress, even the feeling of that sin. Even the crack addict, the alcoholic, every emotion, every feeling, every anxiety that you would have in your sin, God heaped on Christ to pay the price. The covering, the judgment was fully upon Christ. And we are in him. When God shut the door to the ark, he said, okay, guys, you are the righteous ones. You are the saved ones. I am going to shut the door, and I'm going to give you safe passage through this flood. But those three men, and Noah and his wife and their wives, they got into that ark. But guess what they had to do? They had safe passage, right? But you know what? They didn't pull up their lazy chair, and they didn't watch the floods. They didn't just watch the animals. They got in, and they had to do some stuff. They had to make sure things were kept alive. They had to make sure everything was fed. They had to make sure everything was clean. They got in and they worked because of what Christ asked them to do. You are saved, but your job is to take care of the animals which were going to populate the earth. And in the church, I believe the same thing takes place with us. In our salvation, when we become in Christ, we are saved. We have our, we have our ticket punched to heaven. But that is when our work begins. We are safe and our safeness is free. We have been saved by Jesus Christ and by him alone we are saved. We are a free gift from God for our salvation. But here's where God tells us to do. As the body of Christ, as the church, our job is to bring people to the ark. Bring people to Christ. Bring them so everyone can see. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is our job. Because when God looks at wickedness, 
It stirs his heart. We look at our culture today. We have wickedness. We see what's going on in our world today. And we wonder, what is going to take place if we are just like the days of Noah? They didn't think about God. They didn't think God would establish his kingdom. They didn't think God would do any judgment. But when Noah was 600 years old, and on the second month, on that 17th day, when the rain water started flowing, and the water started coming in, and the floods covered the earth, God did something that nobody thought he would do. He acted. He acted in a mighty way. They didn't know God. They didn't like God. They didn't talk about God. And the Bible says, and as the days of Noah, so will be the day that Jesus Christ comes back. And you know what? In our culture today, when you talk about God, who? What? I don't know God. I don't see God. God hasn't done anything great. And in the days of Noah, so will it be when the Son of Man comes back to us. God will bring forth his vengeance upon an ungodly society. It's written in the Word. What we must do as his children, we have to be the ark of God by bringing people that have no relationship with God so they can see Christ and they can be in Christ and allow Christ to take the full wrath of their sin so they can be safe in Christ. Because when God does move, and God will move, it is our responsibility as the body of Christ to take care of every issue that he ever has. But here's the sad part. The weakness after the flood. The weakness after the flood. Over a year, they've been floating around. All of a sudden, they sent the dove, and the dove came back, and, and they found the dry ground, and, and the ark came to rest. And after the waters went down, and they opened up the door, and they got out. They looked back, and now the lineage of man is from Adam and Eve. Now it is coming through Noah and his three sons. Coming through those sons, they had a job to do, and that's to populate the earth. Their job was not to bring safe passage. That's what they had to do. But their job was to repopulate the earth. And when you think about what our job is, is to repopulate the earth, we have to understand at this point, just because they have safe passage, they also have a sin nature. And just like Adam and Eve sinned, they gave to their lineage a sinful nature. And Noah had that sinful nature. And bringing forth into a passage, into the safe passage, they landed and then that sin nature became to flourish again. It would be great if we didn't have that sin nature. But just because God saved through the ark, God still says you are still a human. And in that you have sin within your life. Noah focused on a project instead of God. Noah focused on a project instead of God. Noah did everything that God asked him to do. He built the ark. But then he decided, you know what? Basically, my job's done. I've done everything I needed to do. So, Joe, uh, so Noah built a vineyard. A beautiful vineyard, I'm sure. Here it is, this lush new ground. This, this healthy environment. And he built this vineyard. He built the vineyard so much that um, he, he would make wine at that vineyard. And after a period of time, he became what we'd probably call an alcoholic. He drank a lot of wine. He drank a lot of wine. He exposed himself to his son, and it became a curse upon the nation. So what happens when we put our eyes on ourselves instead of putting our eyes on God? It caused problems because of a nature. Now, I know that when we look at today, having a glass of wine compared to being a drunkard is a whole different ballgame. And we're not here to talk about whether a glass of wine is a sin, but what the Bible is very clear, being drunk with wine is a sin. And when he became drunk with wine, it became a sin 
to God. He was supposed to be the righteous man for God. Noah focused on the project that he wanted instead of doing what God asked him to do. And sometimes when we have great things in our line and we fulfill what God has called us to do, sometimes we can take a step back and we can say, I've done my job. I've done everything I want to do. So we said, what do I want? What is it that I want to do? And we need to turn around and say, God did great things through me. God has done for me some wonderful things. And that's not about what I can do. We always should always say, what does God still want for me to do? There's always something. It may not be as great as I once did, but as long as I still focus on God and I do something great and mighty for the power of God, I can keep my focus on God. But so often what we do once we've been successful, and churches do this all the time, we become successful. We've done certain things. We've done what God has called us to do in the past. And we sit back and we say, look at us now. Look at what we have done. Look at what I have accomplished. I am someone. We sat back and we started admiring what I used to do. We started looking back at what I used to do. And I like what I used to do. And God is saying, I'm not satisfied with what you used to do. Don't get off the focus. Keep your eyes on Christ. Do not sit back and watch others do what I've asked them to do. If you would be focused on me, I can do great things with you and through you. But here's what he did. Noah got lazy after the challenge. Noah got, and he got lazy. He got lazy. He did what he wanted to do. And sometimes after great accomplishments, it's easy to get attacked by Satan the most. After you've gone through something and you stood up for God and God has allowed you to go through a great accomplishment and had victory over certain things or maybe have won people to the Lord or maybe your kids are doing something great and you've done something wonderful for them and you look back and you see God work and you saw what God did through you and we sit back and we expect what we've done in the past to continue into our future. And we sit back and watch. And when we sit back and watch, we get lazy. We get lazy to the point that we become just non-existent for Christ. And then we wonder where God's power is. We wonder what we could do. We wonder, what does God want for me? And it becomes sad when people of God people that love God, people that have been saved in Christ. They've gone through the floods of their world. They've been saved through the power of God. And they get out of that ark and they look back and they say, okay, thanks God. Thanks for what you've done for me. I'll take it from here. And the wickedness of idleness is not any different than the wickedness of drunkenness. You know, in our sin, in Noah's sin, God picked this sin, but because he had a sin nature, he could have picked any sin. He could have picked any sin to say, you know what, I'm trying to bring a point here. The point is not that you're going to be perfect. The point is that you have a sin nature. We all have that sin nature. We all need salvation. We all need Christ within our life. It's awesome to see what Christ, Christ can do through us, and he wants to do through us. But when, it, when you look at Enoch, you look at this old man by the name of Methuselah, 969 years of age, a prophet. Even his name, when he is gone, the judgment will come. And through Methuselah's life, 500 years of Noah's life, he proclaimed the judgment will come. Repent. Repent. You need to repent. The ark of God is going to be here. All you need to do is get into the ark. All you have to do is get into the ark and you will be safe. There's no difference between what Noah and Methuselah said, get into the ark than what we are saying today to people that turn away from Christ. Give your life to Christ. 
When you give your life to Christ, you can be saved. But people reject us, people will laugh at us, and they ridicule you. Until one day. Until one day when God acts again. And this time when he acts, he's going to come. And he's going to receive those that are in Christ. And we are going to be gone into Christ. And the judgment of Christ will be upon the face of the earth. Our job, before the judgment of Christ comes again, is your family. My family. Just like Noah did with his three sons. I need to make sure they are safe in the ark. We need to make sure our family, our influence, are safe in Christ. Because just as the days of Noah will be, so will be the coming of our Lord. With our culture today, the wickedness today, I truly believe, I truly believe the Lord is coming soon. I truly believe that it's our job, that we are the ark of God. We are the church that is the ark of God. Our job, as the doors are open, and we can invite people to get into the church or the ark of God, to communicate what Jesus Christ is all about. He's already taken the pain. He's already taken the punishment. And he says, would you please invite? Because the judgment of the Lord is coming. And it's not going to be a flood because the promise of the rainbow is I will never flood this earth again. But what I want to give to you, I want to give to you peace and hope. And I want to give to you an eternity with Christ. But if you do not get into the ark, if you do not get into Christ, what happens is the judgment of hell will be upon every person that does not know Christ. What is the ark about? The ark is about a picture of salvation from the wrath of God. What is the picture of Jesus? It's the picture of salvation from the wrath of God. The wrath of God is hell. The blessing of God is is eternity in heaven. The difference, are you in Christ? Are you in the ark? Are you on the outside and the judgment of Christ comes and you're waving your hands and you say, I thought I knew Christ. I thought I was safe. I sang a few songs. I went to church. I gave a little bit of money. It's not going to be good enough. Are you in Christ? Are you a saved believer that has a passion for Christ because the world believes in God even the demons tremble at God but believing in God is not in Christ believing in Christ means I have accepted that Jesus Christ died on the cross and my sins my addictions my failures my faults have been heaped upon his back and he has accepted that pain, and he buried my sins, buried my iniquities. And I have accepted that. And I have put my faith in him because what he has done for me, he is my ark. And I'm going into his life, and God is going to shut the door, and I am safe in him. If we are not in Christ... We are doomed in judgment. The story of Noah and the ark is not about Noah building a ship and two little animals going in two by two and saving so we can repopulate the earth with animals. The story about the ark is God's rescue plan for mankind so we could have access to worship him so we have the opportunity to understand that Christ wants us to be with him forever. It's easy when we think about the world's philosophy of Noah and the ark. It's a story that's funny. It's a story that's pretty. And it's a story that God rescues and God takes care of. But it's so much bigger than that. It's God's provision for salvation. And Jesus is our provision for our salvation. 
What do we do with this? Are we in Christ? And I would say the majority of us here today are in Christ. But just like I, and I'm sure just like you, we have so many people that we come in contact with every day that are not in the ark. That if you would ask them about God, they would say, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I go to church. But what we must do is we have to plead with them. Do you know that the judgment of God will come? Do you not know that you cannot escape God's wrath unless you are in Jesus? Unless you're in the ark. Because we may not have seen God's wrath. We may not have physically seen it or even watched it. But we have to understand God will come again. And when God comes again, when he sends Jesus and takes the body of Christ out, the next step is the wrath of God. And we must allow our family and our friends to hear that story. See, I like what early part of the Pentateuch. I like the idea of Methuselah sitting down with his kids. Enoch sitting down with his kids. Let me tell you what took place. Let me tell you about Adam and Eve. Let me tell you about Cain and Abel. Let me tell you what has taken place. Because I believe when we sit down and we share and we open up our hearts, not just watch TV, not just play the games, but when we get serious with our kids, with our grandkids, and we sit down with them with a pure heart, and we say, let me tell you the truth. That's when the connection between mom, dad, grandparents, just like it was with Moses and Enoch and Methuselah and Noah, they saw it with their own heart. They hear it with their ears. They believe the story because it's your story. Because you're in Christ. Invite others to be in your story. And I believe God will do great and mighty things. Noah and the ark. It's the same picture of Jesus and his church. We need to be in Christ. We will be safe from the wrath of God when we are abiding in Christ. But if we are not in Christ, we are going to be the world that is outside of the ark, screaming for help. And it will be eternally too late for them. It's eternally too late for others unless they know Christ. That is the purpose of the church. That's our job. We cannot fail them because eternity is at risk. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, this simple Bible story has so much more meaning than what this world could ever imagine. It has more meaning, Lord, than we can even comprehend. But God's provision and God's protection is upon this remnant. Allow us, the body of Christ, to be in you. Let us serve you. Let us love you. Let us honor you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor. I really enjoyed this series. Back to the basics. Kind of nice to get these stories refreshed into our minds once again, isn't it?